Welcome to our 51st session of our New Testament series. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Come Holy Spirit, fill the hearts of your faithful, and kindle in us the fire of your divine wisdom, knowledge, and love. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Today we continue with the book of Revelation. This is our fourth session. We've seen all the tragedies that could be happening to the people. And always keeping in mind that John, the author, whoever that John is, it's not John the apostle, but whoever that John is, is telling us that Rome is conquering the world and really persecuting the Christians. So the Christians need a little encouragement. They're being martyred. They're being wiped out in many ways. They're not able to buy the common things needed every day to eat and live. And so John is saying to them, through it all, God is in control. God is allowing it, but God never loses control. The book of Revelation, as I've mentioned several times, is written in apocalyptic language. Apocalyptic language is kind of a poetic language, symbolic language. There are apocalyptic writings in the Old Testament, some in the New, but most in the Old Testament. For instance, in the book of Ezekiel, we find some apocalyptic writings. He starts to talk in imagery. And the imagery is very strong in apocalyptic writings. In apocalyptic writings, we'll see many angels. Angels play a big part in apocalyptic writings. Also, we see some tragedies. But in the midst of tragedies, God is still in control. The tragedies was all, will always be conquered. So apocalyptic writing, highly symbolic. We should not take it literally. As we go through the book of Revelation, we'll see what happens is that there are several different things. There are seven bowls, bowls of wrath. There are trumpets, seven trumpets. It tells the story one after the other of these seven things that are happening each time. We should not read it as though these things are happening one after the other. They're not consequential. What that means is that we don't say, well, now that the trumpets are finished, let's move on to the next seven. They can all be happening at the same time. The book of Revelation is saying to us simply the idea, this is what is going on. It's going on now. To read the book of Revelation, we have to understand again the thinking of the people who are receiving it. The people in Rome they're going through a great deal of turmoil. They don't want to antagonize Roman authorities any more than they have to. And so John, the author, he chooses to use apocalyptic writings. That means he can send this note, this message out. The Christians, those especially of Jewish ancestry, will be able to understand it more readily than others mainly because many of the images come from the Old Testament. And so we should read it in that way. But the overarching imagery is everything is happening because God allows it. And what happens is that eventually it's all leading to God conquering, God winning out in the end. And those who remain faithful will be sharing in God's love. So last week we ended by talking about the destruction of Babylon. So it's the punishment of Babylon and what happens afterwards that we'll be looking at today as we end the book of Revelation. We talked about chapter 17 the last time. Chapter 17 is an image of a woman in scarlet sitting on a wonderful horse. The idea behind that, that's Rome. The woman in scarlet symbolizes Rome. And she's 
a, a queen in a sense. So she's something great. And also what happens is they call her a harlot. A harlot in the sense of this scriptural passage is someone who provides for the needs of others, not just sexually, but provides for the needs of especially the traitors. So the traitors now have to look at Rome. They come and trade with the people in Rome. That's where the, the money is. That's really where all the wealth is. And so that's what the idea behind Rome. Rome is a very wealthy place. But it's also a place of persecution for Christians. Then he starts about the beast. The beast here is really the beast is Nero. It represents Nero. Nero, they felt in legend, was killed, but that he was also coming back to life. And the present ruler, the present emperor, Domitian, he was a very cruel leader. And many felt, well, that's the spirit of Nero in him. So we'll talk about the seven rulers, the seven special rulers, seven emperors. But the seven emperors, and then it talks about an eighth, who is really not an eighth, because he once existed, was killed, but now he's come back. That's the beast. And so the beast is what is worshipped. The dragon is Satan. Then the dragon gives strength to the beast. And then there's a second beast. The second beast is the, are the prophets. The prophets who follow the beast. So they're like followers. They're the prophets of the beast. They're the ones who are spreading the message of the beast. And so that's the way the imagery is given. The idea of trying to understand everything. The beast is meant to be Nero. So now we go to chapter 18. Chapter 18 has much to say to us about the symbolic end of Jerusalem. I mean, excuse me, Rome. Rome is called Babylon in the book of Revelation. In the book of Revelation, they compare Rome to Babylon. Babylon was an ancient city that invaded Jerusalem about the year 587 before Christ. It led many people into exile in a cruel way, killed many people. Babylon was the powerful nation at that particular time in history. And so now Rome, in symbol, in symbol is the new Babylon. So now we read in chapter 18. So the writer says, after this, I saw another angel coming down from heaven having great authority, and the earth became illumined by his splendor. The imagery here is a great angel. It's an angel who now has certain powers, but also has news to share. It talks about a situation that is beginning to take place. It, it's a prediction, a prediction of the fall of Rome. And so it's a symbolic prediction, but it's a special angel. It's an angel who has great authority. So the angel cries out with a mighty voice, a message for everybody to hear. Fallen, fallen is Babylon the great. She has become a haunt for demons, a cage, a very unclean spirit, a cage for every unclean bird, a clay for every unclean and disgusting beast. What they had in those days is the wars that took place. A nation would move into an area, completely devastate, kill the people, men, women, and children, and they would leave the town desolate. And at times, it was almost superstitious. People were afraid to go near that town. It was as though the demons had stayed there now. Evil had stayed there. The bodies of those that were killed were allowed to rot there in the streets. And there were many birds of ca carrion, the birds that came and ate the rotting flesh of those who were killed. So what happens 
It's a haunt for demons, Babylon. It's talking about destruction of Rome. Rome will be destroyed so bad that what's going to happen? It's a haunt, a haunted place for demons. Every unclean spirit will find a cage there. The unclean spirits were not, not able to escape from these desolate places. Every unclean bird would come. Every unclean and disgusting beast would prowl around. So animals would come in to eat the corpses. So this is what was happening when they land a place, a town was destroyed. And then it goes on for all the nations, talking now about Rome or Babylon, the symbol of Rome. For all the nations have drunk the wine of her licentious passion. The kings of the earth had intercourse with her, and the merchants of the earth grew rich from her drive for luxury. Again, not meant to be seen sexually. The idea behind it is licentious passion, a passion for everything, hungering, thirsting for riches. So the nations have drunk of, this, of the riches that Rome had to offer. This is what helped the nation survive because at the center of it all was the strong and powerful Rome. So the merchants grew rich from her drive for luxury. They kept faith, the kings of the earth had intercourse with her. Again, they would go into Rome, they would take what Rome had to offer. Then I heard another voice from heaven say, Depart from her, my people, so as not to take part in her sins and receive a share in her plagues. When it says depart, it doesn't mean pack up and leave. What it really is saying, don't let yourself be taken in by the way of acting of those who are sinful in that city. Don't take part in her sins. So depart from her sins and receive a share. If you take part in her sins, you receive a share in her plagues. You will be punished just as those in Rome who are really taking advantage of other people were also gonna, going to be punished. For her sins are piled up to the sky. Rome has a terrible amount of sins. It's saying it has caused so many people to be killed for the love of God. But God remembers her crimes. So God knows the crimes of all the things that happened in Rome. So now comes the angel's recourse, the angel's words. Pay her back as she has paid others. Pay her back double for her deeds. Into her cup, pour double what she has poured. Give her back a really difficult punishment, the angel is saying. Punish her severely. So what this whole idea is, Babylon, Rome has fallen. It's now become desolate. Don't take part in Rome's sins. This one mighty Rome has really fallen badly. And at the same time, if you take part in her sins, you will also take part in her, her punishment. The measure of her boasting and wantonness repay her in torment and guilt. For she said to herself, I am enthroned as queen. I am no widow and I will never know grief. Again, the message. The message is Rome is so strong and so big, it's as though Rome was a queen. It uses the female image of getting the idea she's a queen, but she's not a widow. That means she still has sources who are protecting and caring for her and building her. So I'm not a no widow. I will never know grief. The pride of Rome. Rome is saying, I'm so powerful. Nobody is going to overcome me. I'm a queen. The message here is one that goes on and on down through the ages. We have seen great nations come and go. Looking back through history, there were nations that might have said very proudly, who can defeat us? We are a powerful nation. 
but they're gone. It's a warning for us. The idea of trying to keep God central, not to let our sins become our guide, not to let sinfulness be that which feeds us, to keep alive our dream of how to serve each other. The real dream, the American dream of being service, sharing, loving, and God as part of our life. So into your cup, pour double what has been poured. To the measure of her boasting and wantonness, return, repay, torment and give, grief. Therefore, her plagues will come in one day. So just when it's not expected, it's going to happen very fast. It's not like people are able to say, well, let's get ready. It's going to happen fast. Once it begins, everything is going to crumble. Pestilence, grief, and famine. She will be consumed by fire. So everything's going to be burned and destroyed completely. For mighty is the Lord God who judges her. So the wrath of God. Once God decides to destroy this great city of Rome, that thought that nobody could destroy Rome, and yet Rome was destroyed. It's kind of a prediction, because when John is writing this, Rome is still powerful. But it's a prediction, a foretelling of what's going to happen to this mighty city. And it's foretelling that the sinners are going to be the ones who will have to pay the price. Then come those who dealt with Rome, the merchants. They really look now on Rome. They're, they're, they're bewailing the loss of Rome. Ironically, they're not bewailing the fall of Rome as Rome. They're bewailing the idea that everything Rome provided for them in, in merchancy and whatever they could share that, that Rome was no longer able to provide these needs. The kings of the earth who had intercourse with her in her wantonness, again, using the sexual image, but at the same time, it meant any kind of giving in, sharing in her sinfulness, becoming greedy, hoping for things along those lines. Those who share in her wantonness will weep and moan over her. They see smoke rising from her pyre. Imagery again. It's as though they're off in a distance and they see the place of Rome, Babylon, Rome, going up in flames and they see it being destroyed. They will keep their distance for fear of torment on her and they will say, alas, alas, great city, Babylon, Rome, Mighty city, in one hour, your judgment has come. The merchants of the earth will weep and mourn for her. Why? Not because Rome was destroyed. Because there will be no more markets for their cargoes. Their cargo, first, precious jewels. Their cargo of gold, silver, precious stones. And then their, their cargo of Clothing, fine scarlet clothing, fine linen, purple silk, scarlet cloth, and then also for building, fragrant wood of every kind, and also ivory. They'll all be gone. The people don't have these anymore, marble. And then also for the luxuries of sharing food, flavoring food, cinnamon, spice, incense, myrrh, and frankincense. And then the gifts of luxury, wine, olive oil, fine flour, wheat, all these luxury things that the poor couldn't afford, but the rich could. And the merchants are saying, we, we, we can't get these things anymore because the supplier, Rome, is being destroyed. Cattle and sheep, horses and chariots, and slaves. That is human beings. So trading in slaves, that was part of the day in which they lived. And they couldn't even get slaves. They couldn't even get human beings. So their sinfulness, 
the merchants take part in their sinfulness. And it shows the depth of their sinfulness <clears throat> when it talks about trading in slaves, human beings. Then the writer goes on to say, the fruit you craved has left you. You no longer have it. All your luxury and splendor are gone. Never again will one find them. So at the fall of Rome, it's not losing a wonderful city. It's losing what the city had to offer. The merchants who deal in these goods, who grew rich from her, will keep their distance for fear of the torment inflicted on her. So the merchants themselves are not being impeded yet. They're not being attacked yet. But they're not going to go into the midst of the fire. They're not going to go back to Rome where they themselves will share in that torment. Weeping and mourning, they cry out, alas, alas, great city, wearing fine linen, purple and scarlet, adorned with precious stones and pearls. In one hour, this great wealth has been ruined. The passing things of the world, in one hour, all this wealth is gone. All these wealthy people in Rome no longer are wealthy. They're going to be people who have to scrounge for food. And so it's happening in one hour, a life has changed. And what it does, it makes people realize as they read this, the passing imagery of what the world has to offer and the need to really trust God. Every captain of a ship every traveler at sea, sailors, and seafaring merchants stood at a distance and cried out when they saw the smoke of her pyre. So they cried out, they were standing at a distance. They were out in the waters on the seas. What city could compare with the great city, they asked. They drew dust, they threw dust on their heads. They're now in, in mourning. That's the idea, mourning, throwing dust on their heads, weeping and mourning. Again, alas, alas, great city in which all who had ships at sea grew strip rich, rich by her wealth. So they grew rich by the wealth of Rome. In one hour, she has been ruined. Rejoice over her heaven, you holy ones, apostles and prophets. For God has judged your case against her. Now we begin to get the good news of the book of Revelation. The feeling for many people is that the book of Revelation is a bad book. It's not. As I've mentioned so often, God's in control. And in the end, God will really win. A mighty angel picked up a stone like a huge millstone and threw it into the sea and said, with such force will Babylon the great be thrown down. It's not only be destroyed in part, it's going to lose everything. It will never be found again, it says. So that power of Rome, Rome and the ancient city of Rome, the ancient empire of Rome, it's never going to be found again. And so what happens is all the joyfulness of Rome and all the luxuries of Rome are gone. No melodies of harpists and musicians, flutists and trumpeteers will ever be heard in you again. No craftsmen in any trade will ever be found in you again. No sound of a millstone will ever be heard for you again. They, they didn't even grain, uh, grind wheat. No lamp, no light from a lamp will ever be seen in you again. It'll be darkness. It'll be a dark, dark, desolate place. No voices of bride and groom will ever be heard in you again. There'll be no more weddings, the weddings they used to have in Rome. Because your merchants were the great ones of the world, all nations were led astray by your magic portion. All, all nations thought, well, Rome is supporting us and all who have been slain on the earth 
will also be people who will come out to condemn them. What it's really saying to us, kind of giving us a warning. A warning is that Rome became very proud. It thought it was invincible. There was no way it could be destroyed. But it was destroyed. It disappeared. It became desolate. It's a warning against all great nations to really trust God somehow, realize the need for God. For God will not just simply cause them pain, God will simply abandon. And once we allow sin to take over, sinful thinking, it becomes very powerful and destructive. Chapter 19. After this, I heard a voice that sounded like a loud voice of a great multitude in heaven saying, Alleluia, salvation, glory, and might belong to our God, for true and just are his judgments. Hallelujah, finally the day has come. He has condemned the great harlot, Rome, who corrupted the earth with her harlotry. He has avenged on her the blood of his servants. Rome has caused much blood with the martyrs. And so now comes the great day when they can say, hallelujah, God is taking over. He has avenged on her the blood of his servants. And they said a second time, hallelujah, smoke will rise from her forever and ever. We will never hear this great city again. And so with the idea behind that is simply the idea Salvation and glory have come. So the 24 elders and the four living creatures fell down and worshiped God. This moment of triumph. They watched everything happen, all the bad things happening. But now they can fall down and worship God. A voice from heaven came. Praise our God, all you his servants. You who revere him, small and great. Then I heard a sound, something like the sound of a great multitude or the sound of rushing water, a mighty peals of thunder. In the Old Testament, Ezekiel talks about a group of people that sounded like rushing water. Alleluia. The Lord has established his reign, God the Almighty. Let us rejoice and be glad and give God glory. For the wedding day of the Lamb has come. He is fried, is made ready for God. The idea behind that, the wedding lamb, the, the wedding, the lamb is now part of our creation. It's like a wedding. It's, it's God joining with the church, the power of the church. She was allowed to wear a bright, clean linen garment. For those who are favored, those who are with God, it's almost like a wedding feast. It's them coming together and recognizing how they have committed themselves to each other. The linen represents the righteous deeds of the holy ones. <clears throat> then the angel said to me, write this. Blessed are those who have been called to the wedding feast of the Lamb. An imagery in scripture is that when we die, we share in God's goodness and love. We come to the banquet of the Lord, the wedding feast. And so blessed are those who come to the wedding feast of the Lamb, the banquet of eternal glory. And he said to me, these words are true. They come from God, the angel speaking. I fell at the angel's feet to worship him, but he said to me, don't. I am a fellow servant of yours and of your brothers and sisters who bear witness to Jesus. Worship God. Witness to Jesus in a spirit of prophecy. One of the dangers of the day was that people were beginning to worship angels. And so it's a warning saying, angels reminding us, the creatures, angels are not God. They're not to be worshipped, called upon for help, but not to be worshipped. And so that's what's being said here. You don't worship an angel. So the angel saying, don't worship me. I'm a creature like you. Then I saw the heavens opened, and there was a white horse. Its rider was called Faithful and True. He judges and wages war in righteousness. 
His eyes were like a fiery flame, and on his head were many diadems. He had a name inscribed that no one knows except himself. Back in those days, you weren't allowed to name God. They used the name Yahweh to say, I am who am, go around that. But to name something was to control. So now what we have, we have the God from heaven, but did the inscribed name, no one knows what the inscribed name is. He wore a cloak that had been dipped in blood and his name was called the word of God. The word of God comes and shares with us a two-edged sword, comes and cuts through creation. And what happens now is that it was dipped in blood. Jesus had to suffer. Jesus suffered and the martyrs too. Jesus has joined with the martyrs. The armies of heaven followed him mounted on white horses and wearing clean white linen. An imagery of that great army of those who remain faithful. Out of his mouth came a sharp sword to strike the nations. He will rule them with an iron rod and he himself will trot out the winepress, the wine of the fury and wrath of God the Almighty. In those days, they would trot out the wine. You see it in some simile in some countries today. They trample on the wine and out comes, I mean, trample on the grapes and out comes the wine, the great wine press. But this imagery here is the wine press of people and God's justice. God is trampling them out as though trampling grapes and the wine coming out is the blood of those who have not remained faithful. He has a name written on his cloak and on his thigh King of kings and Lord of lords. The word of God, Jesus. Then I saw an angel standing on the sun. He cried out in a loud voice to all the birds flying high overhead. Come here, gather for the great feast. To eat the flesh of king, the flesh of military officers, and the flesh of warriors. The flesh of horses and their riders. The flesh of all free and slave, small and great. They had battles. What would happen, as I mentioned earlier, they would leave the bodies in the fields and the birds would come. Birds of carrion would come, feast on the bodies. Animals would come also. So here an angel's calling all these birds to come and enjoy themselves because all this sinfulness is now laid out before them. They can feast on the sins of the world. Then I saw the beast and the kings of the earth and their armies gathered to fight against the one riding on the horse and against the army. So now the warriors are now out to get Jesus. The beast was caught and with it the false prophets, those who followed the beast, who had performed in his sight the sign by which he led astray those who had accepted the mark of the beast, 666, Nero. So they were thrown into alive into the fiery pool burning with sulfur. Imagery, even borrowed from the Old Testament, God sends fire and sulfur down from, the, from heaven. The rest were killed by the sword, the sword that came out of the mouth of the one riding on the horse. All the birds gorged themselves on the flesh. Chapter 20. Then I saw an angel come down from heaven, holding in his hand the key to the abyss, the he a heavy chain. Earlier, we saw where an angel came from heaven and opened up the abyss. He sees the dragon, the ancient serpent, who is the devil or Satan, and tied it up for a thousand years and threw it into the abyss where he locked over it and sealed so that no one could lead the nations astray until the thousand years are completed. Symbolism. So what happens, we're not meant to take it literally. It doesn't mean, well, now we begin a thousand year reign or something. It has nothing to do with the thousand years saying a long time. That's really what the thousand years means. After the thousand years, 
it says they will the dragon will be released for a short time then what happens now john he sees a sees thrones it's entrusted those set on those who are entrusted with judgment i saw the souls of those who had been beheaded for the witness to jesus and for the word of god who had not worshipped the beast or the image though had carried its mark on their foreheads they came to life and reigned with christ for a thousand years again not meant to be exactly a thousand a long time the rest of the dead did not come to life until the thousand years were old. So those who were not faithful, when the dragon was thrown into the abyss, it's like everybody else was thrown into the abyss with the dragon. Those who were sinful, they didn't come now back until the dragon would later be released. Then this is the first resurrection. <clears throat> Blessed and holy is the one who shares in the first resurrection. First resurrection, those who come and share in Christ. They're really people who have died, but they've been raised. But then it talks about the second death. That has no power over these. The second death are those who have died and gone now on into eternal glory. So that's the second death. The second death followed by eternal resurrection. They will be priests of God and of Christ, and they will reign with him for a thousand years. When these thousand years are completed, Satan will be released from his prison. He will go out to deceive the nations to the four corners of the earth. So they saw the earth as flat as though it was a table and the four corners, very large table. Gog and Magog, they were the ones who would destroy. That comes from Ezekiel. Gog is the false gods. God is the passionate, selfish greedy etc but it's destroyed in ezekiel's writings magog is the place they comes from so they gather for battle their number is large as large as the sand of the sea it says they invaded the breadth of the earth they north south east west they surrounded the camp of the holy ones and beloved in, in the beloved city but fire came down from heaven and consumed them. The devil who had led them astray was thrown into the pool of fire and sulfur where the beast and the, and the false prophets were. There they will be tormented day and night forever and ever. They will no longer be able to be around anywhere. They will be tormented for the rest of their existence. Next, I saw a large white throne and the one who was sitting on it. The earth, that's the large throne, the one who's sitting on, of course, is God. The earth and the sky fled from his presence, and there was no place for them. I saw the dead, the great and lowly, standing before the throne, and scrolls were opened. So now it's the time of judgment for everybody. Then another scroll was opened, the Book of Life. The book of life is where the people who have been faithful, their names are written in the book of life. So this is another scroll. The sea gave up its death, is dead. Then death and Hades, they gave up their death. All those who died, Hades, the deaths of death. All the dead were judged according to their deeds. So this is a vision. John is having this vision. Then death and Hades were thrown into the pool of fire. There would no longer be death and Hades for those who have survived in the book of life. This pool of fire is the second death. For all eternity, they will be tormented. Anyone whose name was not found written in the book of life was thrown into the pool of fire. Chapter 31. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. In Isaiah, we read about a new heaven and a new earth. In Jeremiah, we read about this new heaven and new earth. The whole former heaven and earth has passed away. 
and the sea was no more. The world has ended. I, said, I also saw the holy city, a new Jerusalem. A new Jerusalem, an imagery of a new temple coming down out of the sky, coming down from heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband, glorious, ready for the wedding feast that is about to take place, the wedding feast between God and all of creation that is written in the book of life. I heard a voice from God's throne saying, behold, God's dwelling is with the human race. Now the human race is lifted up. That's the heavenly banquet, the heavenly feast, the heavenly celebration. He will dwell with them and they will be his people and God will always be with them. God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There shall be no more death or mourning, wailing or pain. The old order has passed away. So God has now brought all kinds of glory. The old order, there'll be no more weeping, no more pain. It's an eternity of some kind of glory. It's not imagined by that sense. I mean, it's not something that says, I can understand what eternity is like. We can't. Every kind of thing here on earth that we enjoy, we long for, is really part of God's creation. But then once we expand more and recognize God, We'll be able to understand much more about God's creation and God than we do now. The one who sat on the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. Write down these words, for they are trustworthy and true. He said to me, They are accomplished. And then these are the words I am the Alpha and the Omega. First and last letter of the Greek alphabet, the beginning and the end. To the thirsty, I will give a gift from the spring of life-giving water. Thirst for goodness, thirst for love. Life-giving water, refreshing water. The victor will inherit these gifts, and I shall be that person's God, and they will be my children. But as for cowards, the unfaithful, the depraved, murderers, the unchaste, sorcerers, idol, idol worships, and deceivers of every sort, their lot will be the burning pool of fire and sulfur, which is the second death. We're not meant to say, well, that means that there's fire and sulfur in hell. It's an image. Whatever kind of punishment is being talked about here, we really don't know, but it's as if it was like this. So we don't know. It's not really saying this is what it's like. No, that's not the purpose here. One of the seven angels who held the seven bowls filled with the seven plagues came and said, come here, calls John. I will show you the bride, the wife of the lamb, human beings, Jerusalem, the new Jerusalem. He took me in spirit to a great high mountain and showed me the holy city of Jerusalem coming down from um, out of heaven from God. It's not really Jerusalem as we know it here on earth. Jerusalem, using that term Jerusalem, the city of God. So it's really what it means we can see the new city of God coming down from heaven. It gleamed with the splendor of God. Its radiance was like that of precious stone, like jasper, clear as crystal. They use the, the very, very valuable imagery of jewelry here on earth. But in eternity, it won't many, mean anything. These are, this is what it looked like. They use human images, comparisons. It had a massive high wall with 12 gates where 12 angels were stationed and on which were the names inscribed, the names of the 12 tribes of Israel. Everybody in the Old Testament symbolically saying on which this is named the people of the Old Testament. There were three gates facing east, three north, three south, three west. In those days when they built a city, they would often build a, a wall around it, and there would be gates to enter. The gates we left open during the day and closed at night to protect anybody who would try to break in. The wall, wall of the city had 12 courses of stone as its foundation. 
and on it were inscribed the 12 names of the 12 tribes of the land, the apostles. The one who spoke to me held out a gold measuring rod to measure the city, its gates and its walls. In Ezekiel, Ezekiel told to measure, measure Jerusalem, measure the city. And he has a companion who goes with him in this measuring. That's a comparison now that John uses with the Old Testament. So he's talking about the city of God, the new Jerusalem. The city was square in length and the same also in width. He measured the city with a rod and found it 1,500 miles in length and width and height. Perfect square. He also measured its walls, and they were large. The wall was constructed of jasper, again, something very shiny, jewel-like. The foundations were decorated with every precious stone. Things that mean something to us here, maybe, or some people, is actually something that will not mean that much, but they're looking for comparisons. What is it like? It's like precious stones. So then it describes the precious stones. The 12 gates were 12 pearls, each of the gates made from a single pearl. That would be amazing, a large pearl. So it's unimaginable. And then John says, I saw no temple in the city, for its temple is the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb. The city had no need of sun or moon to shine on it, for the glory of God gave it light, and its lamp was the Lamb. So there would be no darkness. It would be totally the Lamb giving light to this new Jerusalem. The nations will walk by its light. So the light of the land will always be there, filling them with hope, love, joy, righteousness. And to the kings, the earth, they will bring their treasures to this new Jerusalem. During the gate, during the day, its gates will never be shut and there will be no night there. So they never have to shut the gates because it's always daytime. And so the gates are always open. Open gates are a sign of peace. So there be peaceful. Nothing unclean will enter it, nor anyone who does abominable things or tells lies. Only those will enter whose names are written in the Lamb's book of life. Then the angel showed me the river of living water, sparkling like crystal flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb down the middle of the street. So it's now nourishing everything. On either side, tree of life. The tree of life, one of the trees, it produces fruit every 12 times a year, once a month. The leaves of the tree serve as medicine for the nations. Not only does it provide food, it provides medicine. It'll keep people well all the time. It will look upon the face of God, upon the face of the Lamb, and faith, the name of the Lamb, will be on their foreheads. Finally, knowing God, night will be no more. And he said to me, this is an epilogue now. The epilogue is like John stepping outside the story. He's now told us all about the book of Revelation and the revelation he received from God. But now he's saying, and he said to me, these words are trustworthy and true. And the Lord, the God of the prophets, spirits, sent his angel to show his servants what must happen soon. So this is what I received. I was told that it's going to happen soon. Behold, I am coming soon. Blessed is the one who keeps the prophetic message of this book. So the book is a book from God. And the ones who keep the prophetic message, who read it and recognize there's going to be hardship, there's going to be difficulties, but we have to remain faithful. And if we remain faithful, we'll be part of this new Jerusalem, this new glorious kingdom in which we will share with eternal light and glory, the Lamb of God, Jesus. But the angel said to me, don't. When he tries to fall down and worship the angel, the angels, don't do that. 
I am a fellow servant of yours and of your brothers and sisters, the prophets, of those who keep the message of this book. Worship God. And the angel said to me, do not seal up the prophetic words of this book, for the appointed time is near. Earlier in the book, he was told not to write things down. Now he's told, don't seal it up. Let people see it. Let the wicked still act wickedly and the filthy still be filthy. The righteous will do what is right and the holy will be holy. So life will still go on. This is what's going to happen. This is what we're preparing for. This is what our faith and our hope are leading us towards. But there's still going to be turmoil in life. Everything's not going to end and say everything's beautiful right now. But in the end, it will happen that way. Behold, I am coming soon. I bring with me the recompense I will give to each according to his deeds. So God says, I am the Alpha and the Omega the first and the last, the beginning and the end. Talking about God, God is here always. God has always been here. God is here now. God will always be. The Alpha and Omega, the first and last letters of the Greek alphabet. And so it's saying nothing beyond that. This is basically all God's promise, all God's gifts. Blessed are they who wash their robes so as to have the right to the tree of life and enter the city through its gates. In the story of Adam and Eve, that story, it talks about a tree of life. A tree of life is a tree that gives life to them. It's not the tree of good and evil, it's a tree of life. And so what happens is they have this eternal glory, a tree of life, now the tree of life, a revived image of the tree of life. It will always be there for them. The tree of life will go on for all eternity. Outside are the dogs, the sorcerers, the unchaste. Outside this new Jerusalem, the murderers, the idol worshipers, and all who love and practice deceit. So outside, they're going to be outside. They're not going to be here in this wonderful new city of Jerusalem. When he says outside, he's not saying everything's going to continue on. But what he's saying is those who are now outside the love of God, those who are now sinning, they'll be outside. I, Jesus, sent my angel to give you this testimony for the churches. I am the root and the offspring of David, the bright morning star. In the Old Testament, it talks about a root coming from the stump of David. So he's the root of the stump of David. So even though David dies, passes on from his ancestry, are going to come, and his offspring are going to come to Christ. So I am the root of David. The spirit and the bride said, come. Let the hearers say, come. Let the one who thirsts come forward. And the one who wants it receive the gift of life-giving water. It's all there. It's all there for us. We have to respond. Come. Saying to us, come. This is the life-giving water. But you must come to its shores. You must come and share in this life-giving water. The one who gives this testimony says, yes, I am coming soon. Amen. So what he's saying is that Jesus is saying, yes, I'm coming soon. What it really means is that in the end, at the end of time, soon, when this was written, we really had no idea what the world, when the world was going to end. But here it just simply says, I am coming soon. So then John says, come, Lord Jesus. Come, Lord Jesus. We hear this in the liturgies, we have it in our liturgy today. Come, Lord Jesus. The idea being, that's our prayer. So John bursts out in prayer. Come, Lord Jesus. And finally, he ends it in the normal way of ending any writing. 
written in those days. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. That ends the book of Revelation. The book of Revelation, as I've said over and over, it's not meant to be a tragic book. It talks about difficulties, pain, suffering. But in the end, see what happens. A new Jerusalem. There'll be no more tears, no more shedding of tears, no more pain. There'll be love. And that's really what eternity is all about for those who remain faithful. Eternity of love. The gift is so far surpassing that there are martyrs who are willing to give their life, their very existence here on earth to be sharing in this eternal glory. And the eternal glory is not just the place of eternal glory, it's the person of eternal glory. It's Jesus Christ to share for all eternity in life with Jesus. Life with Jesus. It's not simply meant to be a place. Heaven's not a place. It's an example, an experience, a loving state. So what's really being said here, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, yes, come Lord Jesus. And that's what we want to say. And that's what the book is saying. Jesus says, I am coming soon. And we respond, come Lord Jesus. It's a book that says, remain faithful. Because there's good days ahead. Good periods ahead, we should probably say. Good time ahead. Hard to speak without time thinking. But there's an eternity ahead. An eternity of a loving God. In our next session, we'll be moving on into an overview of the Old Testament. The overview, however, will not just simply be saying, this is what the history of the Old Testament is or anything along those lines. But realizing we're reading it from the viewpoint of people who know the New Testament. So we'll see what message do we find here that are meant to be eternal messages in the Old Testament. Following the history, the prophets, the books of wisdom, what are they saying to us today about our life with Jesus? And so we'll have an overview of the Old Testament with our eyes always focused on the New Testament, on Jesus Christ. May the light of Christ lead me, the power of Christ be with me, the wisdom of Christ inspire me, the word of Christ instruct me. The shelter of Christ protect me. The hand of Christ hold me. And the love of Christ be with me. May the grieving find support in me. The sad find joy in me. The depressed find hope in me. The weak find strength in me, the doubters find faith in me, the rejected find love in me, and the world find Christ in me. May Almighty God bless you in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.